right, everyone, we're going to get started. Good evening. My name is Roseanne Santos. I am the Director of Alumni Engagement at John Jay College. I wanted to make sure there was a little nostalgia, so I have Heron Hall in the evening behind me, so you guys don't forget where our home base is. Um, I am so happy to have you here today. Firstly, I hope that on behalf of the um, Alumni Relations, you're all, you're all staying well and staying safe and know that we support you. And if there's anything that we can do in this time of crisis, I'm not sure what, but please do not hesitate to reach out to me personally. You can find me at alumni at jjay.cuny.edu. This evening, we have a really great program in store for you. We have an alum who is now on the other side of the country doing amazing work. And he's gonna talk to us about how he's been able to build his career within government. And his name is Andrew Phelps. I'm not going to get into a biography because I think he'll be able to do a better job of sharing his career path and his career journey. But I do wanna start by asking him to complete this sentence. If it weren't for John Jay. Uh, I wouldn't have had any student debt at all, no. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> John Jay uh, continues to be one of the greatest values in higher education. Uh, Liz. No, I, I think uh, if, if it weren't for John Jay, uh, I literally probably would not be an emergency manager. Um, it was really my experiences, I think, uh, for the school uh, where I, I found what the what career path made the most sense for me. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's uh, it really opened my eyes um, to alternatives beyond what I had in my little head when I was filling out the initial application uh, to, to go back to school. I was, uh, I think, like like many John Jay students, a non traditional student. I had taken a, a stab at college uh, right out of high school and. Uh, was studying theater and getting C's and D's in theater classes and, and then getting a C or a D in a theater class, you know, it's probably not the right time for you to be in school, I think. Um, so, so uh, lived a little of, of life and, and um, uh, really uh, just had kind of a profound experience um, like so many of us on, on September 11th, 2001. Uh, I was working uh, as an actor in New York City at the time. Um, that's actually a lie. Uh, I was auditioning a lot in New York City at the time, not so much working as an actor. Um, and and uh, just ex experienced um, the tragedy of the day uh, from my rooftop in Lower Manhattan uh, in the East Village. And, and just uh, the, the feeling of, of seeing everything unfold uh, was, was certainly impactful and traumatic. Uh, but even more so was just this sense of not not being able to do anything to help. Um, uh, I certainly was not uh, an emergency guy at that point, um, but felt compelled to try to do something and um, immediately began researching what maybe I could do to try to be part of, of a larger response or prevent something like that from happening uh, to my community uh, sometime in the future. Um, so. You know, did did the FDNY test and was like number two thousand eight hundred and sixty four or something on the list and uh, the NYPD list. And I was like number seven on that, uh, but didn't know if that was going to be the right path for me or not. Um, and uh, eventually uh, helped start the first community emergency response team, CERT team, um, in New York City. Uh, we started that in Battery Park, uh, where we moved. Um, my wife and I moved there about six months after nine eleven, so uh, early. Uh, in the spring of, of 2002, uh, and that, of course, was a community that was uh, a residential community that was as impacted as anyone was by 9-11. Um, and so that kind of opened up my eyes to emergency response and, and some, some of the things that could be available, but it, it really wasn't until uh, I enrolled at John Jay as a fire science major um, that I, I start to understand what else could be out there for me. Uh, I, I, I volunteered as a search and rescue uh, technician um, with the Wilderness Search and Rescue Organization, um, uh, first aid, CPR, all that stuff. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll, I'll do firefighting. That sounds fascinating and uh, like a way to help my community. Um, and really, it was all about timing. Uh, I, I started uh, at John Jay 
uh, with one or two classes in the spring of 2005. And then in the fall of 2005, I think as part of my fire science undergraduate degree, uh, I had to take an uh, intro to public administration. And that started, I think, August 20th, 21st, something like that of, of 2005. And my professor, I don't know if anyone here uh, had her, um, she, she passed away, I think, a year or two after I had her, but Dr. Uh, Lottie Feinberg, um, just this wonderful woman, um, about as, as progressive and liberal as they come. She's from Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, at the time, of course, uh, President Bush was our, our president. She was no fan of the president. And I think would begin every class talking about how she wasn't a fan of the president. Well, like a week or two into class, Hurricane Katrina happened. And Professor Feinberg just was incredulous at the ineptitude of the federal response or how she perceived the federal response and uh, FEMA should be doing this and FEMA's failing at this and FEMA's not doing this. And I didn't know what FEMA was or really anything about it. And I'm like, well, that 100% that sounds right to me uh, based on what I was reading and hearing and seeing. So I started researching what FEMA was all about, what their mission was. And, she and I would kind of go back and forth a little bit about what FEMA's real role is versus the state's role versus the city's role and uh, who should be doing what and how the process was supposed to work. And just we had these fantastic debates um, all through this lens of public administration. Uh, and, and I kind of found that public administration was really kind of this melding or an opportunity to meld my love for um, uh, helping my community through emergency response and my interest in politics. Uh, and, and this long-held interest I had in government and how government worked uh, and the, the intricacies of government. Um, so it was really through that class, that, that intro to public administration, where I'm like, well, this emergency management thing sounds kind of neat, and I don't know if I want to be hauling hose up high-rises for the next 25 years. Um, so I, I started looking more into the emergency management versus fire science, and it was hard because John Jay has so, so many just world-renowned fire science professors, uh, Glenn Corbett and a whole bunch of other folks that are just uh, incredible. Yeah. Um, so it was just this, this kind of weird timing thing. And I, I, you know, a budgeting class, I would, I would write a paper about how to develop a budget for a local emergency management organization, an HR class about how to staff an emergency coordination center and doing staffing patterns. I was able to kind of find ways to weave um, this newfound passion for emergency management really into all my coursework. And, and for me, that kind of solidified um, that as a path uh, to do what I think I wanted to do. And I was still a volunteer firefighter and loved doing that. Um, but it was really kind of that administrative piece and that government piece and, and working with the politics and, and mayors and city councilors uh, and explaining some things that were fairly complex, especially to uh, a mayor who had to worry about budget issues and uh, sewage and, and all these other things of uh, being able to say, oh, by the way, when we have a, a disaster or an emergency, these are some of the things we need to do to make sure that we're able to uh, implement emergency procedures and, and access emergency funds and work with the states and work with our neighboring counties and communities through mutual aid. And, um, yeah, it was just just kind of, uh, kind of fascinating, but it, it Long story short, it wouldn't have happened, I don't think, uh, were it not for my time at John Jay, and especially the timing of, of that particular yeah. class at John Jay. Timing is everything. Um, and not for nothing, but it, it spoke a little bit to theater and drama. I mean, I would say emergency management has its own level of that aspect, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, right? And It, it is, there's, there's so many overlaps. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I did as an actor was in improvisational theater um, and a lot of similarities. You know, you don't know what's going to come up next and you've got to work with different partners that do different things. Um, and my mother always reminds me that I'm on TV much more as an emergency manager than I ever was as an actor. So there you go. Uh, if, if that, that may tell you all you need to know. Yeah. Um, before we move on to kind of your current, um, maybe the last five years in, in your career, you mentioned that you became part of the first CERT committee or CERT. Um, can, you yeah. can you kind of talk a little bit about what that is and how does someone get tapped to be on something like that? Yeah, so it was super exciting. So we moved to Battery Park um, and uh, CERT, Community Emergency Response Team, uh, was a, a federal program where it's been kind of co-opted by FEMA uh, but it began out in California as a way to engage citizens and communities to be part of 
uh, a local community response in the event that uh, existing first response networks are, are overwhelmed. And, and they saw this with some of the devastating earthquakes in California where communities were cut off and didn't have access to law enforcement or EMS or, or uh, fire service uh, agencies. So the communities were kind of on their own for a while. So they wanted to teach people how to do basic search and rescue, how to do basic medical triage, um, uh, how to provide first aid, how to do traffic control, and, and learn a little bit about the incident command system and how uh, volunteers can plug into an incident command system structure uh, during a larger incident. So we had uh, a gentleman by the name of Sidney Baumgarten, who was a retired Brigadier General who lived in Battery Park, and he was like, yeah, we need to do this for our community down here. We were totally isolated and cut off from the rest of the city. You know, we had every first responder from a three state area on the other side of the West Side Highway. Mm -hmm. And if we needed an ambulance here in Battery Park, we were out of luck, we weren't getting one. Um, so, so that community, I think, recognized pretty quickly the need to be uh, self-reliant, um, which is unusual in a city like New York. I think that something could happen where you wouldn't have every service uh, imaginable available at your fingertips. Um, so we started this, this team working with FEMA Region 2 uh, to do training and, and uh, we, I think our first round of training occurred in 2002. Uh, we had dozens of volunteers come out and be part of the training uh, and we worked with New York City OEM to implement the training and, and I think uh, OEM here in the city liked what we were doing and, and we expanded it to include um, all five boroughs and now I believe each community board has a CERT that's associated with a community board. Um, and it, it's, it's grown exponentially and it's, it's really a pretty big program now I think in New York. Um, but that was kind of my um, introduction to, to emergency management and emergency response uh, with really that kind of grassroots community level. Right and I'm glad you said that because oftentimes we don't always see the value in some of the volunteer work that we do and some of the community work that we do. We'd like, oh, that's extracurricular, oh, that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal. And it's, it's so interesting what you say that Battery Park City was completely cut off and thinking about the city's map and geography, I'm like, yeah, I see that now, but I'd never thought about it until you talked about it this evening. Yeah, pretty incredible and, and, and something I don't think anyone would have thought of before that event that that could have happened, um, but it certainly did. And then, you know, during Hurricane Sandy, we saw similar neighborhoods, uh, especially in Brooklyn and Queens on, on Long Island, um, being isolated and cut off due to fires and flooded roads and collapsing infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really important program. And uh, in my current job, I get to speak to a lot of volunteer organizations, and I always make a point of reminding them or, or letting them know um, I began my career uh, as a volunteer. Yeah, so great segue. Um, please share with us kind of what has led to your current career. If you can tell us your title and a brief summary of what you do and maybe what has led you in that path because we're already starting to get questions. So I want to get to those questions, but I do Absolutely. want to hear the full picture of your career journey. Yeah, it's been uh, a, heck of, <laughs> a heck of a journey. Um, uh, so currently I serve as the uh, director of the Oregon Office of Emergency Management. Um, my office uh, is relatively small, about 48 people, but we're responsible for statewide uh, all-hazard emergency preparedness, planning, training, and exercises uh, to, to get ready for anything from a winter storm or a wildfire to uh, something as dramatic as a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which if you, if you remember the uh, New Yorker article that came out a couple of years ago called The Really Big One, profile this this earthquake threat off of the Pacific coast that really is going to be probably the most devastating naturally occurring disaster uh, our nation will face. Um, so that'll be fun uh, if and when that happens. Uh, we, we're responsible for millions of dollars in federal grants that come into the state of Oregon. Uh, we also uh, manage the state's 911 program and infrastructure. Uh, we're not 911 call takers, but uh, we manage the system that gets that 911 call from your cell phone or your landline uh, to a 911 dispatch center. Uh, and then my, my specific role, uh, I, I don't do much emergency management anymore. Um, kind of a, I'm an administrative uh, paper pusher, uh, but I serve as the governor's authorized representative and the state coordinating officer whenever we have a federal disaster declaration. So I interface directly with uh, my federal counterparts from FEMA and to help manage uh, our statewide disaster response. Uh, and, uh, Again, it sounds very exciting, but there's a reason they don't make movies about emergency managers. It's all signing paperwork and, and doing grant applications and 
uh, occasional news conferences, and that's why it's exciting to get close most of the time. Uh, well, then, you must feel excited because you're in it, right? You're you found a really successful, if I may say, I, I don't know you personally, but from everything I've read and seen, it's a successful career in government. So we all find our niches and who knows where we're gonna find that niche as per your story. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think if, if you would have asked me when I was uh, walking across the stage at the theater at Madison Square Garden and getting my diploma uh, back in the spring of 2008, um, I would not have envisioned that this is where I would have ended up. Um, uh, my, my first position outside of, uh, after I graduated was in New Mexico. It was kind of this entry level um, preparedness coordinator position working for the state of New Mexico, uh, but it exposed me to all different kinds of planning opportunities and, and participating in exercises and doing training and uh, working with local emergency managers and tribal emergency managers and just this, this myriad of experiences um, that then led to, to me being hired to be the emergency management director for the city of Santa Fe, the capital city uh, in New Mexico. Uh, and, uh, a small town, you know, 80, 90,000 people, but being the state capital, just uh, a lot of eyes on that city and a lot of big city problems for a small town. Uh, and, and through those experiences, uh, I was selected to, to lead the state of Oregon um, in this role. Uh, and I, I remember like my first week or two um, working for the state of New Mexico as that kind of entry level emergency manager thinking, gosh, wouldn't that be great if like in 30 years I could maybe be like a deputy state emergency management director. Um, but uh, uh, things have happened a lot quicker uh, and I wanted to be able to, to take advantage of the opportunities um, and I'm just uh, incredibly fortunate to have been selected to, for this job and, and to have been in it for as long as I have. Uh, I'm now five and a half years in this position. Um, the typical state emergency management director uh, it's in their position about two to two and a half years. There's a tremendous amount of attrition and turnover um, in state emergency management positions just because of the stress and um, the political nature of a lot of the work that we do. Um, the National Governors Association, they do briefings for new governors uh, after every election cycle. And one of the things that they tell their governors uh, is hire a good emergency manager because you will not get reelected uh, if you fail in your disaster response. Um, I think we see that time and time again. Um, that emergency management isn't always something that's at the forefront of, of debates during during the political contests. And, and uh, no one ever asks uh, uh, the presidential candidates, who's going to be your FEMA administrator? No one ever asks governors, well, who are you going to hire to be your emergency management director? Uh, but it becomes a really important decision. Um, and, and again, not because of the person who's in the position, but because of the teams uh, that they're able to build and the way they're able to collaborate with, with other partners and nonprofits and, and other levels of government. That's really um, where the skill uh, set lies, I think, with emergency managers. Well, I think it's so important that you say these things because many of John Jay College's alumni, current students, we're not in it for the fame, right? We really want to do good things for whatever communities we land in. And these people like yourself, the people behind the scenes, the people keep building strategy to make sure that we're gonna be as safe as possible, right? Because we can't control an earthquake, right? You talked about what the tectonic plates in, you know, on the West Coast, we can't control that. Very no sciencey of you, Roseanne. Thank you, you know, I, I did my homework. And, but we can, or you, people in your position or in public administrators can put strategies in place to minimize um, death and destruction. Um, you know, as much as you can when mother nature kind of sets her mind to something. But, and I think that's so crucial and I think it's so important, a word that I've been saying a lot today in my discussions at work, um, servant leadership and being a public servant, this is what it is. It's, you're not, you know, if you're getting 15 minutes of fame, something really bad is happening, you know? <laughs> Yeah, generally, uh, when you're in, in our line of work, uh, being on TV and, and being in front and center uh, means you've probably screwed something up, um, which is why I, I've, I've really loved the opportunities that we've had here in Oregon um, to talk a little bit more about preparedness uh, and being on, on the media for, for those types of things as opposed to when things go, go sideways. Um, we've got there's so many great people out here in Oregon that have, that have um, helped shift, I think, the culture of preparedness uh, statewide. 
Um, but you're, you're spot on, Rosanna. You, you can't eliminate every hazard, but I think our jobs, especially in government, um, is to try to prevent those hazards from becoming disasters. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do that through, um, you know, really exciting things like building code and land use issues. <laughs> uh, but all of these things that, that I, as an emergency manager, don't have a lot of control or influence over necessarily, but it requires us to build these uh, alliances and partnerships and uh, work in this collaborative space to talk to elected officials and say, hey, you know, I know affordable housing is really, really important. And that one piece of land that's available to build some affordable housing is in a floodplain. And guess what? We haven't had a flood there in 60 years. I don't know how much longer we're not going to have a flood there. Uh, and you're going to be in a real bad way if you build that affordable housing there um, and, and things get flooded. One of the things I was able to learn uh, coming into Oregon was the history of a community called Vanport. Um, and this was a community uh, in North Portland uh, that was essentially a planned community for minority workers. Um, folks that worked in, in, in Oregon's industry, the shipyards, and it was built in a floodplain. And after about 10 or 15 years, uh, they had this massive flood on the Columbia River and it devastated Vanport, killed dozens and dozens of, of people, again, mostly black and brown community members, um, and, and left the city really devastated in a lot of ways. And it, it, it goes to show sort of this intersection between the, the hazard reduction work that we do and social science and, and issues of equity um, that we don't always do a real good job of addressing, I don't think, and we certainly see that today, um, no matter where you look. Uh, but it, 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 it frames for me, I think, the, the importance of the work that we do, not just in our disaster response, but how we recover from and how we mitigate against future hazards, how we look at things through an equity lens and make sure that um, that I'm not trying to protect the communities that look like me or my family, but I'm trying to uh, protect uh, the communities that are reflected of, of everyone that lives uh, throughout Oregon. Um, language barriers, economic barriers, educational barriers, uh, all of these, these challenges that I think for a long time we as emergency managers, uh, emergency management has been a, a pretty uh, old white guy, former military, former law enforcement, former fire profession. Um, I, I hope that we're getting to the point now where we're seeing much more diversity and experience coming into to, uh, the work that we do as emergency managers and, and being able to be more reflective of our, of our communities and speak to um, the cultural needs of the communities that we're here to serve. Went off on a tangent there a little That's bit. Okay. No, <laughs> actually, what you're doing is creating more questions in my head, but I want to give the audience, sure. they've already started asking some questions, Gladian Rivera asked, have you worked with CISM teams as well? Oh, and if you um, could explain what that is for the lay people in the room. Sure, so CISM, Critical Incident Stress Management, um, sometimes it's referred to as PTSD. Um, it's essentially trying to, to manage or work through the trauma that we experience, not just in, as emergency managers, but first responders, and um, more increasingly, our volunteers and other folks that, that have secondary or tertiary uh, roles in, in emergency or disaster response being impacted by, by what we've experienced. Um, I, I'm reminded every once in a while that, that given what I experienced with 9-11, um, again, mostly as an observer, uh, but, but I did have some other um, experiences that seemed to weigh heavy on me. I, I never went through any sort of counseling or anything, and I, and I probably should have. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was about maybe four or five years after 9-11, I was had relocated, well, I guess longer than that, maybe 2008, 2009, well, 2000, yeah, eight or nine. Uh, I had relocated to New Mexico, and it was on the, the one of the anniversaries of 9-11. And I used to watch all the documentaries and everything, and, and just read all the books and the 9-11 Commission Report and everything else, um, and, and was really kind of a student of 9-11 uh, in a lot of ways. I, I was driving into work, and the local radio station to commemorate the anniversary was playing the 1010 Winds broadcast from that morning. Mm. Um, and I love listening to 1010 Winds in the morning. That was my thing. Uh, and I just turned on the radio and I, I wasn't really prepared for it. I just hear, you know, 1010 uh, Winds, your news uh, traffic All day, and every weather. Day. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It just the, the familiar voice. And I recognized what it was. Um, and it messed with me a little bit, I think. Um, and really kind of since that experience, I haven't been able to, to watch a lot of the commemorations and media and, and things about it. Um, but, but CISM, it, it's an important way for us, I think, as, as people that are involved in traumatic incidents to process what we go through. Um, cops, firefighters, even emergency managers, 
Uh, we try to be tough guys and, and we're here to protect the communities and, and, and alleviate suffering, but we often neglect ourselves. Um, during our COVID response, uh, which is still ongoing here in Oregon, uh, we had most of our teams working 12, 14 hour days. And very early on, um, our Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, which trains all of our state uh, law enforcement and firefighters and, and mental one dispatchers reached out to um, an organization called Responder Life. And it's an organization made up of, of therapists and clergy and uh, uh, behavioral health uh, social workers uh, who come in and work with the FBI, they work with law enforcement, state police, fire departments, and they, it was the first time they came into our state's emergency operations center. Um, and uh, we had, had kind of created this little room a year or two ago called our wellness room. We've got some comfy couches, some, some soft white lights, and like Enya playing in the background, but kind of like a place to go and chill and relax when you need a 10 minute time out. Um, we kind of set up shop in there and we're available just for folks to, to talk and decompress. And it, it didn't occur to me early on, but, but it came pretty clear uh, about a week into this incident um, that this was going to be a very long term duration response for us. Uh, and, and, you know, usually when we have a disaster in Oregon, like a flood or a fire, you evacuate the community, most people are safe. They may have lost their homes, they may have lost possessions, but generally they're safe um, once you get them to safety. It, it was really hard, I think, for a lot of us, and it continues to be hard, knowing that even if we do our jobs really, really well and do all the, the, the testing and contact tracing and get, get PPE and N95 masks to everyone who needs it, people are still dying because of this outbreak. No matter how good we are at our jobs, no matter how great our, our plans are and how well we move resources, we're still losing people. Um, and, and that weighs, I think, on our, on our emergency matters more so than it does with other hazards because you don't see these people being brought to safety. What you see is, is the daily count, yep, four more fatalities today, yep, 28 more hospitalizations today. Um, and after a month or two or three, um, it becomes really hard and, and, and exhausting in a lot of ways. Um, and you add to that this dynamic where we are working, you know, 16 hour days at the emergency operations center and you go home to maybe families where the, the family's kind of on lockdown and schools are closed and maybe your spouse or your partner's uh, office is closed so they're home and they're trying to find things to do all day. They're bored out of their minds and you're just going a million miles a minute. So that disconnect um, can be really challenging. So having things uh, like critical incident stress management and um, therapists, behavioral health social workers, those folks being available to talk to you and just you know, I'm not looking for a clinical diagnosis here. I just need someone, an, uh, a third party, a, an unbiased third party, just to get some stuff off my chest. I don't want to talk to my supervisor about it because I don't want to be judged. And, and, you know, my colleagues, they've got their own problems. I don't want to unload on them. Um, but having some of those resources to take advantage of uh, becomes really important. And I think our experiences over the last three or four months here in Oregon um, will probably change the way we use those services moving forward. I'm grateful for the Thank question. you. Thank you so much for being so honest and candid about it as well. Um, Rachel Love, she asked the question, what are the most important skills you need for a career in public administration? That's a great question. It is a great question. Um, so I, I would say that there are two things, uh, three things that would make someone a successful public administrator in, in my eyes. Um, and again, emergency managers, we're public administrators. Uh, we're not riding fire trucks. We're not hanging out of helicopters. We're, we're pushing paper around and we're dealing with uh, uh, administration. You know, we do the emergency side pretty well, but it's the management side that we struggle with. So I think the three things, um, if, if I could tell someone who aspires to be a, a, a bureaucrat, and a bureaucrat's not a bad thing, by the way, uh, someone who aspires to be a public administrator, um, I, I would say um, develop strong collaboration skills. Um, we have to work across disciplines, across jurisdictions, across levels of government, uh, across departments, agencies, every day. Um, and I think I've found that no matter what your role is in, in government in particular, um, there's very few things that we can do on our own. Uh, we rely on our partners, we rely on open communication, uh, and we rely on this notion that um, me and, and three of my partners can create something better together than any one of us could create on our own. And I think that drives a lot of what we do. Uh, 
granted, there's certainly times during a disaster in particular where it's like, you know what, I'd love to collaborate and have focus groups and, and throw 16 ideas against the wall and really think about what the best solution is, but darn it, we've got to make a decision now to save lives. Uh, and you don't have time to, to do that kind of collaboration that, that most of us uh, are frankly enjoy. Uh, so you have to be comfortable making those type of decisions, but you need to, to be able to recognize when you have opportunities to collaborate and to collaborate effectively. Um, the second piece, I think it's, it's a little bit harder to teach and, and harder, I think, in a lot of ways to gauge in ourselves, but it's something I think, especially as leaders, we need to look out for when we're bringing people into our organizations is emotional intelligence. Uh, every time I do an interview, especially for a leadership or a management position, I try to put three or four questions in there that specifically gauge um, emotional intelligence. Tell me about a time when you got difficult feedback uh, uh, is, a, is an interview question I like to ask. And I'll, I'll either get really great questions where someone's very honest and open and, and talks about how hard it is to kind of get feedback sometimes, but how you can grow with it and change. Or you'll get people that be like, yeah, I've never had difficult feedback. Hmm, really? Interesting. Or, yeah, I got difficult feedback one, one time when I walked into my boss's office and, and she said I was fired. Hmm. There's probably some difficult feedback that came before that point. Um, and, and if you're missing that, that's, that's maybe not a good fit. So, uh, those, those two aspects I think are important. And then the third piece, again, these aren't things necessarily that you're gonna put on your resume, but it's this ambition and this drive. Um, working in government, you're, you're oftentimes uh, exposed to folks who are retired in place. They've got a great government job, they've got those great government benefits, they're gonna punch in at eight o'clock, they're gonna take their 15 minute union work break, they're gonna punch out for their hour lunch, they're gonna punch out again at, at 3.15 for their 15 minute union break, and at five o'clock, boom they're done. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, but I think if you want to, uh, if you aspire to something greater, if you aspire to be a leader in your community and find ways to lead through your role as a public administrator or a government employee, um, having some ambition and some drive and this willingness to continue to learn uh, and to teach uh, the folks around you and, and do so in a, in a compassionate and uh, humble uh, sort of way. Um, can really do great things, I think, uh, with a career in government. Thank you. That was excellent. I love that retired in place. That's really candid and um, observant. We're not recording this, are we? Oh, wait. Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. That's fine. Well, you didn't name names. Um, we have another question here from Chris Tacopino. I am majoring in public administration and desire a career in public service along the lines of emergency management and law enforcement. My question is, what would you think is the best way to get into emergency management? Internship, volunteer work? Oh, what a great question. So yeah, my, my personal journey involved a lot of volunteer work um, and it was, was learning everything I could about emergency management. Um, <laughs> so uh, as I was going through John Jay, I had a, a, a brand new baby girl uh, and, and living in Battery Park, we had uh, a mom's group. So it was like me and like 15 moms uh, and, and their, their kids. Um, and so one day I'm like, you know, I'm gonna, we, we would bring in like speakers sometimes and they used to kind of engage the moms and the parents. Um, but it was really me and a bunch of moms. Um, I'm like, I'm gonna do a presentation on how to prepare your home for an emergency. And I just did some research and gave this presentation and then it turned into like three other presentations for other community organizations and neighborhood associations and all that stuff. And just trying to find opportunities to to build up that resume because it can be hard i think to to document applicable experience and things that um uh, hiring agencies are looking for when they're bringing on candidates uh if you go to church uh or you've got kids in school offer to be part of the safety committee or offer to write um an evacuation plan do some of these things that are that are uh available out there um that can maybe help uh build your resume a little bit give you some tangible experience um and show love, love of creativity, uh, creativity, oh my goodness. Um, I remember uh, when I was working with uh, New York Search and Rescue, which uh, was a volunteer search and rescue organization that did a lot of wilderness search and rescue. One of our team leaders was this uh, detective from NYPD, who worked up in the Bronx. And we're talking, I'm like, yeah, you know, I used to be an actor and I'm kind of hoping that like my creativity will help me, you know, like with a career in government. And he's like, oh no, no, nope, in government, we want people that can see things black and white, follow the rules follow checklists, there's no room for creativity in the government, man. And I found the exact opposite to be true. Um, there's plenty of room for creativity. So if you can, can demonstrate your ability to be creative and innovative, um, I think that goes really far. Uh, 
those volunteer opportunities, I mentioned CERT and the emergency response teams, a great way to get some experience. Um, I think now too, there's opportunities to be a digital volunteer um, to organizations uh, like virtual operations support teams. New York has a VOST virtual operations support team. It's a group of volunteers that come together during emergencies and disasters to help um, with rumor control on social media and identify trends and, and, and problem areas where there's uh, flooding issues or needs for donations and things like that. Um, the Red Cross is another great resource to volunteer uh, with. Um, so, so don't don't discount those volunteer opportunities. I know as, as someone who, who hires a lot of people, um, if I see someone that has four or five years of really kind of innovative volunteer experience and has done a bunch of things as a volunteer versus someone with like a 15 year career as a cop or a firefighter, I, I, I may lean more heavily on that person that's got that varied um, and innovative volunteer experience versus someone who's got that um, less directly related fire or, or law enforcement experience. That was really insightful. Thank you. Um, speaking of which, you said you hire a lot of people and we're living in, I mean, the class of 2020. Let's just talk about the class of 2020, what they graduated into. They didn't even have a ceremony, right? That's the worst of it all. But really, this uncertainty around economy, but there's a lot of, I would imagine people are working and are essential working, essential workers in your neck of the woods. So you talked about some of the things that would make someone stand out above the crowd, if you will, on their resume, that level of volunteer work. What are, can you give us an, some examples of things that maybe people should not do if they come before someone like yourself in an interview? I mean, I'm sure you've seen the best and uh, the worst, I mean, I'm just going to say it, um, but really, what are some of the pitfalls? Because I think that's equally important for our audience to know. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I have this, this strong connection and level of empathy with the class of 2020 and what they're walking into. Um, I'm the class of, of 2008. I graduated in 2008. I think we all can remember what the economy looked like uh, in the summer and fall of 2008. The housing market had crashed. Um, Things were horrible, uh, not good at all. Uh, and, and I ended up uh, making the decision at that point to leave New York City uh, uh, and, and move to New Mexico for a job opportunity, um, making the amount of money that, gosh, I couldn't have, have afforded uh, to buy groceries if I was making that living in New York. And it was, it was a really scary experience, uh, but ultimately turned out to be uh, the best decision I could have made. Um, so I, I think folks need to be open to, to different opportunities and think about, you know, do you want to be an emergency manager or do you want to work for New York City OEM? Those are two very different things. Do you want to be a law enforcement officer or do you want to work for NYPD? Um, do you want to be a prosecutor or do you want to work for the Manhattan DA's office? Um, if you want to be an emergency manager, all kinds of opportunities across the country, uh, both in the public and private sector. If you want to work for New York City OEM, very few opportunities and, and those are pretty coveted spots. Um, I, I think uh, the one thing that helps a candidate stand out in my mind um, is how prepared they are for the interview. Um, when I was interviewing for this position, again, I felt wholly unqualified for this job. Um, in fact, I applied by mistake. Uh, I was uh, applying, I was very happy with my job with the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, but I saw an opportunity to apply to be a county emergency manager for Multnomah County, which surrounds the Portland metro area here in Oregon. So I'm like on the, 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 the hiring website and I'm filling out my application and doing all that stuff. And then I get a notification that the state of Oregon was hiring a state emergency management director. I'm like, well, that's fascinating. Those are like appointed political jobs. You don't see those jobs posted at all. That's weird, huh? When I go back uh, you know, to my screen, I'm, I'm hitting my, my application stuff and hit submit. I get this pop-up notification that says I successfully submitted my application for the state emergency management job. Well, how the heck did that happen? Apparently, uh, both Multnomah County and the state of Oregon use the same hiring platform, so it defaulted to the last job I had looked at. Oh, cripes. So I had to go back and like uh, edit my cover letter from Multnomah County to the state of Oregon and, and all that stuff. I mean, well, we'll see what happens. Um, and lo and behold, uh, I got the interview and um, ended up getting the job. The best part was like, Six weeks after I started, I got an email from Multnomah County saying that I wasn't among the most qualified position, uh, people that applied for the job. 
So I said, well, I'm, I'm going to withhold some of your grant money. I think, well, no, I can't. No, that's not true. Uh, but it was just kind of, kind of one of those, one of those things. But, but preparing for the interview for this job, I had never been to Oregon. I'd never, uh, outside of some time in, in California, never been on the West Coast, never been to the Pacific Northwest. Um, probably could have had trouble picking Oregon out on the map. So I, I dove into the state and did all kinds of research. I, I built this binder with maps and census data and researching um, historical disasters in the state and their FEMA declaration process, their staffing, their organizational structure, um, the names of state legislators and pending legislation because they were in a legislative session and just really over-prepared. Um, but I found myself able to leave a lot of that information into my responses to questions. Um, uh, so, Andrew, if you get this job, what would, what would you want to do in the first six months? Well, I know that Oregon doesn't have a, a, a local preparedness coordinator uh, program here, and that's a program that I had in New Mexico that I ran, uh, and I'd really want to see if, if there was interest in local emergency management to build that kind of a program. Um, and it turned out that that was one of those things that local emergency managers here in Oregon have been dying to have started, but I knew that they didn't have that because of the research that they've done. You can really tell when you're interviewing folks who has done their homework and who hasn't. Um, one of the first interviews that I conducted, this was back in New Mexico, was for an exercise officer. And so we start the interview and we're like, so tell me about your, your experience building an exercise program. Again, this is an emergency management agency, exercise program. Uh, and the person like, well, you know, I, I used to be a personal trainer and uh, I'm pretty good with aerobics and, you know, I, I teach jazzercise classes. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not the kind of exercise we are talking about. Um, but clearly someone that just hadn't prepared for, for what they were walking into and didn't know the organization or even what the role was. Uh, wrong kind of exercise. Um, they were in great shape, uh, but they did not get the job. Uh, so, so doing research uh, and, and being able to articulate how well you understand where it is that you're going to try to work and why you want the job and, and um, that you've made a little bit of an investment into Preparing for the interview goes a long way. You know, if you've ever tried to hire somebody, you know the insane amount of paperwork that goes into posting the job and going through HR and and weeding out through all of the applicants and, and minimum qualifications and, and all that stuff. It's a lot of work. You want to know that the applicants have have at least met you halfway and done some homework to find out what your organization is all about, what the job is all about, and how uh, they could fit into that structure. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Um, and researching the organization is more than just knowing the name and the address and, you know, maybe the name of the president, right, um, or the leader of the organization. So that the fact that you had a binder, I'm just like. It's literally still in like that shelf. I could probably go, go and grab it and show you so maps and everything. But, you know, to your credit, you're not applying for a cashier job in the supermarket. This is, you're going to have people's lives in your hands. And it speaks to the importance of who is being, who, who are the people being put into these positions? What is the dedication that they have to the consequences of an emergency should one happen? So it, it is, it becomes important. I think that's the lens that I try to view when, when we do hiring. Um, the last year or two, we've, we've revised all of our job postings and kind of go out to, to almost eliminate references to emergency management because we found we were getting very narrow candidate pools of people that were cops or firefighters or military. And I, I can teach someone how to, to work with FEMA on grant programs. And I can teach someone um, the, the concepts of disaster planning and how to, to work in our emergency coordination center. Um, but I can't teach someone how to figure stuff out and how to find information um, and how to, how to do public speaking and how to engage and interact with others. Um, and, and since we've done that, we've also, uh, for recruiting processes, we, we try to do an hour-long conference call with prospective applicants as part of the application process. So during the open hiring period, uh, we advertise, uh, you know, call this 1-800 number at, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the hiring manager and some agency leadership will be on this call to answer questions about the job. If you're interested in, hire, in applying for it, uh, we'll be available to answer questions. And um, we have found that those two things combined, um, de-emphasizing traditional emergency management experience as part of the qualifications and doing some of these um, open forums for prospective applicants uh, to have their questions answered has really diversified the applicant pool that we're getting. Um, again, we're, we're a fairly monochromatic state in a lot of ways, not a whole lot of diversity. Uh, it's something we're trying to change. Um, and just some of those fairly simple actions, I think, has uh, really broadened um, our applicant pool for, for our hiring, which has been fantastic. 
Well, I think what you're talking about is something that I've done a lot of research on personally, which is what I call essential skills, but what the world knows as soft skills. You can't teach critical thinking, which is what you're talking about, problem solving. And even your top three um, skills, collaboration skills, emotional intelligence, ambition and drive, there's no ambition and drive 101 at any college and university. These are things that we learn, quite honestly, outside the classroom, running organizations, doing volunteer work, um, being in a mom's group, right? This is where we learn these kinds of things. And I think it's so crucial, particularly for our graduating students and our very uh, recent alums, to really start to think about their interviewing as more than just hard skills. Because if you can't write a sentence, if you can't draft a memo, right, then it doesn't matter to me that you're really good at Excel. It depends on the job. If you're hiring an accountant, maybe, okay. uh, yes. maybe those Excel. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, coming into New Mexico, uh, I had the fortune of working for a woman who's been one of the most fantastic bosses I've ever worked for. She's fantastic. Um, and she was uh, the leader of our, our preparedness division within the, the New Mexico Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Super smart woman, been with the agency for a long, long time, hated public speaking, hated it, wouldn't do it. Um, you know, just trying anything she could to either avoid it or uh, chemically alter her states so that she could make it bearable to do public speaking. Um, and I would come with her to, to conferences and things, and she's supposed to be, be on the, the agenda to speak. And like five minutes before she was supposed to speak, she'd be like, Andrew, I can't do it. You got to go up there and speak for me. Okay. So I find myself in all of these opportunities with, with um, high ranking FEMA officials and other state partners where I was given the opportunity to kind of make my voice heard and, and um, have these experiences that uh, uh, I, I don't know that I would have had were it not for those opportunities. So. Uh, when opportunities present themselves, um, you have to, I think, trust that you're ready for those opportunities. Um, know when to take advantage of them. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we talk a lot about luck, I think. Um, and maybe there's a little bit of luck into it. Uh, but I think it's it's more about knowing when an opportunity presents itself and how to take advantage of it. I think that's an important part. I want to delve. I have another question, but if no one asks it, then I'll ask it at the end. But right now, very importantly, you've mentioned a few times and in our pre-conversation in the first 15 minutes before we began, this idea that a place like Oregon is not quite as diverse as obviously New York City. So what would you tell um, the John Jay demographic, our women of color, our, our black and Hispanic men, you know, what do you have to offer for us to go out there? Uh really great microbreweries and coffee and, and donut shops. Uh, that's kind of what Oregon is known quarters. for. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, it, it can be hard um, to, to leave New York in a lot of ways, um, regardless of your background, your ethnicity, your race. Um, New York is home for so many people. And, uh, you know, there are folks I know that live in New York City that don't leave like a four block radius. What? You want me to come to Oregon? No, thanks. Um, it definitely takes a, a bit of a, a leap of faith, I think, to do something like that. Um, but there, there are, are so many other opportunities and experiences to be had. Um, and, and stepping outside of your comfort zone uh, certainly requires a bit of a leap of faith. But again, I think it comes back to your career goals. <laughs> Moving to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, in, in a lot of ways, I was a racial minority. I didn't speak Spanish. Um, uh, uh, was one of the few white guys that was part of the city leadership uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and uh, there's certainly things that you have to do to adapt to those types of environments. Uh, I, I will say that, especially in the emergency management community, I can't speak for other communities, um, it's been my experience that emergency managers um, are one of the most embracing communities that I've ever uh, been able to work with. Again, I've, I've been in fire service and, and uh, working in, in the private sector. Um, you, you see aspects of it, but uh, really the folks that work in emergency management are all about sharing information and setting each other up to be successful um, and learning from each other's mistakes. 
Uh, I, I often joke that there's like only ever been one emergency management plan that's ever been written and other people have just taken it and changed the, the name of the jurisdiction on it. Um, we, we love to share stuff and, and, and help people be successful. And I think we recognize too that if we as emergency managers don't need to do more to uh, broaden the diversity of our profession um, and, and take some, some pretty serious actions to, to bring up that next generation of emergency managers, um, I'm not going to be able to retire and I want to retire someday. Right. So we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're laying the groundwork so that we have uh, people that want to be emergency managers as opposed to relying on folks that had a 25 year career in fire or the military law enforcement. And those are emergency managers that brings in such a different perspective than somebody who grew up um, in New York and experienced what you experience as a kid living in New York. Uh, and when you're in high school, you're like, you know what, I'm gonna go to John Jay and I'm gonna study emergency management. When I was in high school, there was no going to school and studying emergency management. And even when I went to John Jay, uh, there really wasn't that emergency management undergraduate program. I was a public administration major. Um, I, I transferred from a, a fire science major to a public administration uh, manager, a uh, public administration uh, degree. Um, and they had this kind of weird, like, you could do like criminal justice public administration or law or all these different things, or like a choose your own adventure public administration degree. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do that and I'm going to call it uh, uh, emergency management and planning. And I worked with an advisor and I took like some security courses and some law enforcement courses and some fire science courses and kind of made this cool little little program. But now you're starting to see these undergraduate programs pop up um, more often at John Jay. And I love the fact that we've got uh, people that are graduating high school and want to go and study emergency management people that went to school for emergency management, and that's what they want to be. They don't want to do uh, 20 years as a cop or a firefighter and then fall back on emergency management when they can't uh, do those careers anymore. Uh, I think that's really important, and it gives us um, a much different perspective than what we've had in emergency management. You know, we're, we're sort of at the third wave of emergency management. The first wave was the civil defense era, very militaristic, Cold War, um, planning for the nuclear holocaust. And the second wave, I think, was after 9-11, where we had people coming into emergency management, trying to change careers. And, and that certainly was, was uh, compounded by Hurricane Katrina and people's experiences with that. So you had people like me, who were adults and working professionals who said, you know what, I wanna do something different with my life. I'm gonna go into emergency management. Well, now we're into that third wave. Um, and, and I think with, with our, our COVID-19 experience and some of the other big disasters we've experienced as a nation, you've got more people that are entering the workforce that this is their career goal. They want to do emergency management. It's not just something they've fallen into. Uh, and I think that's tremendously exciting. And I, I think as a leader and, and all of us as leaders, um, if, if we're working in the emergency management world, we can do all we can to kind of foster the continuation of that growth and growth and, and pushing for those third wave emergency managers to enter the workforce and, and give them opportunities to do that. Not that you aren't busy enough, but I think you would be a great um, online teacher for the MPA or the public admin undergrads um, because of the stuff you're saying is really it's almost commonsensical and insightful. Careful, I, I work for the government. You don't want to accuse me of having too much common sense. <laughs> well, I mean, I, would, I want to believe that our emergency managers have common sense. I like to think so. You know? um, I think that's, where we, that's an important place to have it, if, if nowhere else. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm thinking they would love to hear more or learn from you. I mean, like I said, I know you have a ton of work to do already. Um, and I guess my, my final question for you, um, unless anyone in the audience has any other questions, I certainly don't want to dominate the conversation. If there and, are, Roseanne, if there's questions we didn't get to, if you want to like email them to me, I'll do my best to answer okay. them. We can try to get those out to people. There haven't been, but I want to give people an opportunity if they have one top of mind. Um, but I think given... Listen, we are in an emergency right now, all over the country, all over the world. If it's not, pick, pick your poison, uh, racial inequality, police brutality, COVID-19. Um, and this might be too big of a question and you can alter it as you see fit, but what do you think, what, what, kind of, what should we walk away with as human beings, as someone who's an expert in emergency management? What are some of the things we need to do to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves in this protest slash COVID-19 danger zone? Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard, Roseanne. And, and wow. my, my advice was gonna to be to take care of yourself. Uh, <laughs> I think that's gonna be different for, for each one of us. Um, I think what's helped me is trying to find uh, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Uh, 
uh, there have been so many aspects of COVID-19, of, um, of the unrest, I think, in our nation. Um, uh, just, and I, I don't even want to say newly highlighted, but just like different uh, ways that racial inequality continues to be highlighted in our country. Um, I, I think the fear is uh, it's going to be important to a lot of politicians for the next week or two or maybe a month. Um, and then there's going to be a, another instance where there's outrage and demands for change. Uh, and it's so slow to happen. It can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, and, and I think we're just bombarded with these images and these thoughts of, of, of how messy things are and how unresponsive people can be and how slowly uh, justice and political change happens. Um, we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace, I think, and, and be able to step away from social media and uh, CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or whatever it is you turn into um, uh, and, and understand uh, that I think there's much more good in the world than, than you see if you just spend your whole time looking, uh, scrolling through Facebook or, or, or Twitter or, or watching the news. Um, and that I think all of us, gosh, this is gonna sound like a cheesy commercial or something, but we all have, have the, 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 the possibility, I think, to change at least our, our immediate circle. Um, if something's important enough to you, you can change a much bigger circle. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to impact nationwide policing tactics. I'm not going to be able to change uh, the fact that people continue to build in floodplains or in high hazard areas. I'm not going to be able to change the fact that people are careless with fireworks and start wildfires every year. Um, but if I can impart just a little bit of, of information to allow people to make good decisions for themselves and their families to protect themselves and prepare for a bad day, uh, so that maybe a bad day isn't quite as bad and alleviate a little bit of that suffering, um, then I feel a little bit better Think about what I've, what I've spent uh, the last hour, eight hours, six months, ten years doing. And I know I feel better knowing that we have alumni like you out there in the world. So thank you so much for your time and attention. I know how busy someone like yourself is. I know how busy our audience is. And I am truly very appreciative of your time and your advice to our burgeoning emergency managers and public administrators. And if there's ever anything that you need from us, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, we're here. We wanna do, we wanna do for our alumni as well. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I wanna certainly make sure that I'm able to share my experiences, both positive and negative, the things I think I've maybe done well in the areas I know that I've, I've taken this step. So if anybody uh, has any follow-up or wants to chat at some point, um, Roseanne's got my contact information. I'm, I'm not too hard to find. <laughs> uh, feel free to reach out. And um, yeah, I, just, I, I could talk about this topic all day. It's, it's uh, um, not just a profession, but it's a passion. You're a good man, Charlie Brown, as they say. So thank you for your work. And Oregon is a lucky place to have you. And I wanna thank all of you on the call for being with us this evening. If you have suggestions for future events, if you yourself feel you can um, become one of our webinar facilitators and you have some expertise or thought leadership you'd like to impart on our class of 2020 or even our upcoming class of 2021 um, and our other young alums, please do not hesitate to contact me. I am always looking for more and more people to, to put on the spotlight. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Please, please, please stay safe, be well, and know that John Jay College has your back. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.